I always vote because for centuries people who look like me couldn't, so I take voting very seriously. You know, I think about, you know, what we fought for, and just any time you get a chance, you should vote. Maria Harsha Wusu and Michael Jackson are two of the more than one million Georgians who voted in the May primary. They cast ballots at the North DeKalb Senior Center on Election Day. Across Georgia, incumbents like Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis dominated. Every now and then you get to stop and smell the roses. And tonight we're going to stop and smell these roses. The DA drinking Grey Goose in case anybody wondering. But in a low turnout election like a primary with no races for governor or Senate on the ballot, surprises do happen. Here are voters David Langford and Joe Safford. People need to vote because one person can't do much unless they start by voting. If you don't like how things are going and you try to vote for people that will at least work to change these things you don't like. The 2024 election calendar is zipping along. What clues can these early races give us about the upcoming election this fall? They got more people hitting my voter page than we anticipated for today. Again, it's a good lesson learned for the future when we have the big election in November. I'm WABE politics reporter Sam Greenglass. I'm WABE politics reporter Raul Bally, and this is Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. So, Sam, when when I was checking out of uh, my voting location, I actually asked for my voting sticker. I want to know if you if you got your voting sticker, too. I did. And I usually vote early in person at the library on Ponce. And I got to say, so many kind election workers. There was actually uh, a, a decent amount of people who were there to vote late on a Friday afternoon. The last day of early voting typically has a little bit of a rush at the end, but everything moved really quickly and smoothly. So our family actually moved last year. So I had a new voting location in Gwinnett County. And actually, you know, the most notable thing for me was that the person in front of me thanked every single election worker for their service. Uh, As for me, in and out in about six minutes, uh, I voted on Election Day. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about who people voted for and election results, but I want to pause and talk a little bit about how we vote. I think that tape we heard at the beginning of the pod from Gabe Sterling with the Secretary of State's office is really important. Now, granted, turnout in the primary was about 18 percent. The November election will be astronomically bigger with so many eyes on Georgia's elections and its voters. So election officials do see this spring as an important, you know, dress rehearsal for what's to come. Take a listen to this comment from Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. The challenge we've had is with the United States Postal Service, and they really are going to have to step their game up, you know, coming in the fall. Raffensperger there referring to some delays with mail ballots getting out because of uh, reorganization at the Postal Service, one challenge that election officials are going to have to prepare for headed into November. Now, before we get to November, election officials are gearing up for another round of voting in less than four weeks. Those are the runoffs. In any race where a candidate didn't get more than 50 percent of the vote, the top two candidates head to a June 18th runoff. And one of those races I want to talk about is Georgia's third congressional district. Right. And this race is important because in a crowded field of Republican contenders all cozying up to former President Donald Trump, only one had his endorsement. And Raul, did it help him rise above the fray? And what bigger story can we tell from Tuesday's result as it relates to the rest of this election year? So, look, let's remind our audience, this is the race to replace outgoing Congressman Drew Ferguson, who decided not to run for re-election. He is a Republican. Brian Jack built his campaign around his time in the Trump administration, his connection to the former president, and the endorsement from the former president. You know, at forums and debates, he would work in Trump's name in almost every answer he gave to a question. His campaign signs, the the top two words at the uh, top of the signs, they say Trump endorsed. So, 
you know, very clearly building his campaign around it. He pulled in the most votes. The other candidate to advance out of this field of five is former state Senator Mike Dugan. He talked about a number of things on the trail, but most notably his time as state Senate majority leader and what the Republican caucus got passed into law. Now, Brian Jack pulled in 47 percent of the vote, won 14 of the 15 counties in the district. Mike Dugan won 25 percent of the vote, but he did win his home county of Carroll, which had the second most votes of the 15 counties. Talking to Mike Dugan's folks after Tuesday's election, they're trying to get the endorsements of the other three candidates. He's going to focus on his connections to the district, including representing the district at the state capitol. You know, some of the other candidates did push on this idea that, you know, Brian Jack is an outsider and he's not been in the district. I should note, Jack points out that he's from the district and he talks about his roots to Peachtree City. And one more thing I'm keeping an eye on, whether Governor Brian Kemp gets involved in this race now, now that it's down to two candidates. We did have a couple of upsets on election night where candidates on the far left and far right defeated incumbent lawmakers who have been seen as fairly effective players at the statehouse. So in Cobb County, Gabriel Sanchez, who was backed by the Democratic Socialist of America, defeated Democrat Terry Anulowitz. And in Henry County, Noel Cahan, who has railed against DEI and K-12 schools, has ousted Republican incumbent Lauren Daniel. Daniel became known for toting her baby, baby Zane, around the Capitol while promoting policies like maternal health. Just two years ago, Daniel defeated Cahan by just 22 votes. So look, these are examples of how just a few hundred or a few thousand votes can make a difference either way. Now, this fall, these races that we're talking about won't likely be competitive in the general election. Neither will most congressional or state legislative seats. But there are a few, especially in the metro area, that are worth watching. Raul, can you give us a few that you're following as we head into this next phase of the campaign? Sam, let me give you two races that I'm going to be watching. State House District 53, which pits incumbent Republican Deborah Silcox versus Democrat Susie Greenberg. This district is all in North Fulton County. It includes the affluent suburbs west of Roswell, west of Sandy Springs. There's also House District 105 in northern Gwinnett County. That's a rematch from two years ago between now incumbent Democrat Farouk Muggle and Republican Sandy Donatucci. That race two years ago was 52 percent to 48 percent. The representative tells me he believes that Republican lawmakers who redrew the 105th have made it a little harder to win. And Raul, let's just back up and talk about the reason that we care about these seats. Communities like HD 53 are home to the swing voters who were pivotal to Biden's election in 2020, places that in 2022 split votes for Republican Governor Brian Kemp and Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock, and now in 2024 are wild cards. And then there's places like HD 105 that you mentioned, which showcase how shifting demographics continue to make Make Georgia more politically competitive. So let's take a break here. This is Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. Welcome back to Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. So, Sam, I want to turn our attention to the one competitive race for the Georgia Supreme Court. You know, look, we've hashed out this race a lot already. It was involving former Democratic Congressman John Barrow, who in the end unsuccessfully challenged incumbent Justice Andrew Pinson, who had been appointed by Governor Kemp. Yeah, Barrow sought to turn the race for a state Supreme Court seat into basically a referendum on abortion policy. This tack has been successfully used to catapult progressive judicial candidates to victory in states like Wisconsin. But Pinson, who was backed by top Republicans, won by a 10 percent margin or about 100,000 votes. Pinson actually won in Cobb County and Gwinnett County, which have become Democratic strongholds. Barrow did win in Fulton County, but not in a blowout. 
But Raul, I think it is challenging to make sweeping conclusions about what the result in this race foreshadows about the presidential election to come later this year. Our colleague Patrick Saunders reports that the last time an incumbent Georgia Supreme Court justice lost was in 1922. That's according to University of Georgia professor Charles Bullock. And while abortion has galvanized voters in other swing states, especially where it was literally on the ballot in the form of a referendum, the issue has not always translated into Democratic victories in Georgia. Just think back to 2022 when Kemp sailed to re-election despite signing Georgia's roughly six-week abortion ban. So I wonder, is this an enthusiasm problem for Democrats, or is it that the abortion message Barrow was pushing didn't really pierce through? So I think on the Democratic side for Barrow, the message, as you would say, did not pierce through in this race. I think conservative-leaning groups did a good job activating some of their base voters for this race. The Georgia Faith and Freedom Coalition says it distributed voter guides to more than a thousand churches and reached many more via email, text message, and social media. But again, it's hard, you know, to draw broad conclusions on what the outcome of this race means because of all the variables we talked about. As for Governor Kemp, he also got directly involved through his Georgians First Leadership Committee. He was buying ads and reaching out to voters. He even held an event at the state capitol with Pinson by his side the day before Election Day. I asked Governor Kemp why he was giving that level of attention to the race. Quite honestly, a lot of areas around the state that don't necessarily have a lot of high profile races, either sheriff's primary, legislative primaries, congressional races that are, that have contested, you know, heated primaries. And so we're just trying to raise the awareness that, look, this is a really, really important race. It's at the top of the ticket when you think about a statewide elected official. So let's talk about the overall numbers. Nearly 1.3 million people cast ballots. That's about 18 percent of active voters. Now, we're still waiting to learn the partisan breakdown, but remember, people were able to either choose a Republican ballot, a Democratic ballot, or just a nonpartisan ballot. We do know that from early voting, which may not totally reflect the total turnout figures, you had 47% of people pulling a Democratic ballot and 53% um, voting with Republican ballot, that according to the website Georgia Votes. Raul, I'm also interested in the demographics of the people who came out to cast votes in this primary election, particularly when it comes to race and age. One interesting nugget to think about, of the voters who cast ballots in the May primary, 61.8% were white and about 28.2% were black. Now, granted, this is a primary, not a general election, so we don't want to extrapolate too much. But I think back to this rule of thumb from Professor Charles Bullock, who we we mentioned earlier. He says that Democrats in the Deep South need black voters to account for at least 30% of the turnout in a given election and capture at least 30% of the white vote to have a shot at victory. In this primary, again, black voters made up 28.2% of the turnout. So those numbers likely need to be higher this fall for President Joe Biden to win Georgia. I'll be interested to see whether any of these primary demographic figures extend to the results this fall. And Sam, before we go, let's put a cap on the races you covered for Fulton County District Attorney and Fulton Superior Court Judge. District Attorney Fonnie Willis and Judge Scott McAfee, who are both involved in the Georgia election interference case, beat their challenger. So what happens next? The outcome in these races is not entirely surprising. Both benefited from superior fundraising advantages over their challengers and, you know, the name recognition. At the Inman Park Parade, I actually saw people cheering for them. McAfee won with 83% of the vote. Willis captured 87%. And while pretrial hearings are set to resume next week, McAfee and Willis's decisions will continue to reverberate. The Georgia Court of Appeals has agreed to review McAfee's decision decision allowing Willis to remain on the case amid allegations of a conflict of interest due to a relationship she had with a special prosecutor on the case. That development significantly diminishes chances that Trump's case will see trial this year at all. And this week, Senate hearings continue as Republicans move to investigate Willis's office. 
So McAfee won his race on the nonpartisan ballot. He doesn't face another vote this fall, but Willis will have to go up against a Republican challenger in November, Sam. That's right. Willis's GOP opponent is Courtney Kramer. Kramer served on Trump's Georgia legal team after the 2020 election. She also worked as executive director of True the Vote, a Texas-based group that has helped facilitate tens of thousands of challenges to voters' eligibility in Georgia in recent years. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. You can get more Georgia politics online at wabe.org slash election 2024. Plugged In is a production of the WABE Politics Desk. Our producer is Brendan Rivers. Our managing editor is Alex Helmick. And thanks to WABE's Julian Virgin for that voter tape that you heard at the beginning of the show. And do us a favor, hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. We'll be back next Friday.